life jam. Wow, favorite jam of life. <laughs> no, Alma, it's not a fortnight dance. <laughs> uh, good evening, Zancy. Welcome to Trading SA right here on SABC3. We are back from holiday. Woo! And we're live. We are live and we're your primetime trio. And we're here to help you escape the norm the best way we know how, bringing you the latest trends and topics. I'm Rafilwe, and of course, I'm joined by my faves, Kapalma on my right, looking Elizabethan and fabulous. Yes, love it. <laughs> my Blair over there. And what I'm are you? Back, I'm, I'm back in white with my two evil stepsisters. <laughs> Wow, that's so, so sure. kind. But also helping us unpack, we're ignoring my players' comments, <laughs> helping us unpack tonight's trends is the incredibly funny, the beautiful, and the talented Lisa Khotlabi. Welcome to the show, Lisa Let's get into some top trends, yeah. darling. Pew, pew. Pew, pew. So condolences popped up on the timeline after the news broke of the passing of the much-loved gospel singer Israel Musetla and the talented award-winning thespian Lindy Wendlovo. Their passing has left a void in the South African entertainment industry and as trending as say, we send our condolences to the family, friends and fans of the incredible performers. Now, this next story popped onto my timeline after People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive, yes, the actor Michael B. Jordan, and socialite Bay, Laurie Harvey, took to Instagram in rather grainy pictures to confirm their relationship. So this relationship caused quite a stir uh, and social media frenzy with tweeps deciding, you know, to weigh in, as they do, of course. Broke and bougie. Uh, through Shade saying, Laurie has dated way more people than I've dated in my lifetime, and I'm 37. Peter. Witchy, witchy, woo. Alina <laughs> says, I think the reason we stand Laurie and not others who've made similar moves, like what moves anyway, is because she controls her narrative. I only see or hear about her when she permits. Ayanda Tabete uh, says dating is a process of collecting data, so basically researching, and then when it's not for you, you leave. Or you say, if it is for you, I don't get why people get pressed about exploring. So, Lizeko, why do you think all Lizzie Shimane are so pressed about Lori Harvey? Because men hate when women have agency. So the, the problem is not that she's dating a lot of people or whatever. It's that she's putting it out there. She's choosing. Mm -hmm. She's also dating men like... Oh, the hottest. <laughs> like, I mean, Future obviously is, is quite gross in his actions and his baby daddyism. <laughs> he's hot. He's a type. Guys. He he's is, type. right? These guys, these guys roasted me for saying Future, Future is. Future is a type. He's nasty, but he's Oh, my God. Hot. I don't yeah. want to have children. But she's doing the thing. I want to yeah. meet him in the bedroom. Um, so she always has, like, the hottest guys on her arm. And she just wants and does what she wants to do. People always like to control, especially South Africans, mm. but especially men, love controlling who dates who, when they date, mm. Like, no, I love that she's taking her own thing. And as for that 37 year old who said she's dated less people, step yourself up. But it's also called just dry snitching on yourself because now you're telling us you've got no Yeah, game, you're just telling date. us you're mm. boring and basic. Ew. Okay. And I mean, I believe, I believe, Uguti, guys, just date. It doesn't matter how many people you are dating. It could be simultaneous, but just, just date. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the next story had potential to be something absolutely amazing, mm. but it was not. Mm. So, mm. unfortunately, the vice president-elect uh, Kamala Harris graces that ghastly February issue of the fashion magazine Vogue America. After its release, the cover was met with a lot of criticism, with tweets highlighting how bland and uninspiring it looked. Usi M. Clymer had this to say, there's no theme to this peak. It's like they said, okay, yeah, we'll grab the sheet, stick it in the ground. Ma'am, can you wear those chucks to, and give some pizzazz? Great, that's good enough. Okay, moving on for a cover of the first woman VP. Uh, Myra Leff had this to say. She said, it's the look, she's relatable to you, meaning it doesn't matter what she's wearing. That's who she is. She's a powerful woman. Powerful women can appear in many styles. It's not the clothes that confirm her stature. But do, do you know what? Even if they put a male vice president in a more relaxed setting mm. wearing sneakers, sure. I would still want a little bit nicer everything else there but be happening. Exactly, like a nice background and some kind of artistic direction, right? I think mm. that's what we're arguing with. But listen, just the fundamental thing of lying to your future vice president and saying, yes, ma'am, we are going to use this picture of you on the cover <laughs> and then we're going to bait and switch you and just use yeah, another picture. What so is up with not putting problems. respect on her name? She's Indian. She's the first half Indian, half black, mm. the first female. Mm. The fir There's so many firsts around her name. So I just feel like if there was a, 
a Vogue cover maybe three years into her term and she's kind of like showing you around her bedroom. Yes. Cool. But this is like, this is the monumental moment. Mm. The first black, first female, first. And then it's like, meh. So I just feel like Vogue America specifically has been taking black women, you know, for granted. Lizzo, they did it with Michelle Obama. Yep. They need to look at British Vogue and what Edward Innerful is doing and <laughs> some okay. of that. Before we move he on, I also need to ask the question where Edward was. As what is he like the editor at large, globally, universally, well, blah, blah. British Vogue. I don't know. Everything has been promoted. Oh, yes. Edward, come on. We missed you on this one. You need to step up. I think that other lady needs to go. What's her name? Ish, and I even forgot it. Anna Winter. Anna Winter. She's it's coming time. for Anna Winter. It's time. And Anna Winter is going to end her oh, all the way to South Africa. Mm. But guys, as is the nature of the times we live in, last night we were summoned to a family meeting and uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa outlined further react, uh, restrictions rather that will be put in place to tackle the rising number of COVID-19 infections in the country. So we know that level three adjustments include the closure of land port entries, a curfew that starts at 9, uh, 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. And of course, alcohol sales are still prohibited. Mm. Sorry, kids. So a lot of people felt like it wasn't all that much, you know, there was a lot that we hadn't heard before. Mm -hmm. You could have just sent an email or, you know, how about a tweet? Uh, Jeff Berry said, uh, couldn't you just have said, listen, we're extending level three. There's nothing much different from the 28th of December. Okay, bye. Uh, Gerald uh, Kuena says he could have created a telegram and sent the speech there. <laughs> <laughs> so if you had to tweet last night's speech, go. Let's say uh, everything is the same. Bye. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> except, except, except if you're in Zim, stay there. Yeah. yeah. Like Port oh, of Entry. If you're a black foreigner, you can't come in. Mm. But if you're like a white one and you have a plane, come through. Oh, yes, you can fly from. I would have said, I bought a ring light and I've got an iPad. Watch me. <laughs> Bye. Because that's. A, he bought a ring light. Did you see how he was glowing? He bought a ring light. He Maybe looked... he's just had some water and some sleep. And minded his own business. No, he was, he was lit from the front. You know, it's been no. overhead lighting, the unflattering kind. Uh, yeah, no. He definitely he had, had, he had got a ring light and he got a new chair. I saw, <laughs> we saw everything. Okay, and, and he didn't have that thing around his mouth. <laughs> the thing around his mouth. Basically, it would have been. If I'd sent that tweet, it would have been. That's it. You know? And then you know why. And, and, and you know why. And okay. you know why. And you know why. Mm -hmm. After the break, we'll continue dishing out the top trends with Nesekho and later on the show. We'll be joined by the groundbreaking pulmonologist, Dr. Emmanuel Taban, to talk to you about therapeutic bronchoscopy and why it could save you from COVID. I'm so glad you had to do that. Mm -hmm. Welcome to a Training SA. If you've just joined us, uh, you missed out on a bit of fun with Lesejo Tlabi, who's here. Lesejo, I need to speak to you about this hippo mm. that is jawling around the northern suburbs of Johannesburg. <laughs> I mean, always, always, specifically. Always, wait, always is like, it's outside the line of caucus. I wouldn't quite say it's like in the northern suburbs. It's like <laughs> West rand <-esque. laughs> And That's the only place a hippo could be. Like, how can a hippo get to Santon, please? If you haven't I'm heard the story yet, the Department of Agriculture in Gauteng released a, st a statement saying that someone called the manager when they found a hippo just drooling. Roaming. Just, just I, I thought I knew about hippos, but now I found out something new. Hippos don't have taste when it comes to real estate. That's the <laughs> only reason why you go to four ways. A whole so, farm just whoa. taking on like that. I oh, also did learn something new, guys. I thought they swim. They don't swim. They like sink and run underwater. <laughs> I'm not even joking. They like run that fast. I Which guess. makes them twice as scary. This is exactly. the most dangerous land mammal, guys. It eats people, just so you know. Mm. Okay. Now, on to another topic that has the neighborhood WhatsApp group going nuts. Actual WhatsApp this time. Mm -hmm. um, people are angry because of the new privacy policy, which is now going to force you to share your contact list, your IP addresses, your location, and loads of other stuff with Facebook, who owns WhatsApp. And if you don't, then on the 8th of Feb, they'll just snip, you can't play. The movie, this move has made so many people so angry. Wait, yeah. I don't understand because all these people are on Google Maps. They, like Google Maps actually sends you a list of places that you've been to throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And these people are on Facebook. So I don't understand. Like, also, Telegram. Have you now, now, to the Telegram. fundamental no. problem is this. Uh, the initial promise of WhatsApp is the fact that they aren't selling your 
stuff, mm. right? And so they're breaching that. Secondly, I need to be able to opt out. And now they've given us no options. Like, what, are what are you scared of? What are you scared of? Where are you scared your daughter's going? Oh, like, I'm so nervous. My personal life is so exciting. <laughs> you really? Wait, 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 you're on Instagram. In you're on Instagram. Well, yes. Wait, which one of you have actually moved to Telegram? I'm on Signal and Telegram. You're on Signal and Telegram. I heard yes. Telegram says that when you screen grab, it gives you a notification. I don't want that. I don't no, want that. That's what that's I want. That's the part I want. And by the way, if you're sitting at home, nobody is trying to actually move your nudes. Uma <laughs> Zuckerberg is not interested in exactly. your nudes. It's just where you are and... He doesn't care that you take him to Royale. So, from <laughs> one person who doesn't care about his privacy to another person who can better help us understand WhatsApp's new privacy policy is Tech and founder of Tech Reframed, Brendan Peterson. Welcome to Training SA, Brendan. Hi, how are you guys doing? Fantastic. Now, and I hope you are doing well yourself, Brendan. Let's get right into it. Data protection, access to consumers' private details, a big issue for so many people. We're all in a panic and a fluff. Should we be alarmed? Because when you read through that privacy policy, you also see that EU citizens are exempt from this thing that's gotten us uh, in a stir. So, should we be concerned about data privacy? Always. Always be concerned about that. However, with this situation, as you were saying, you know, normally Facebook and WhatsApp would give you the option to opt out. And when Facebook purchased WhatsApp in 2014, they did give you that option. 2016, that changed. Mm. And what you're seeing now is them sort of just saying, hey, Actually, this is the way things are. So technically, no, they're not selling your data because they're not getting money forward. They're giving it to the parent company. But also, the data that they're giving are things like your phone number, which they already have if you have WhatsApp. Sure. The concerning thing, though, is they're also giving the phone numbers of people who are in your phone book. They might not have WhatsApp. But, you know, other than that, it's sort of things that they kind of already have. But it's funny because Facebook's actually come out and clarified this and said, actually, wait. We're not talking about your encrypted messages. We're not talking about, you know, if you guys are talking about the property prices in four ways. Um, you know, we're talking about <laughs> just the basic information that's going to help us go ahead and provide you better services. We're not going to be accessing your encrypted information. That's still safe, according to Facebook. Mm. Okay, so now... If you are still on Facebook, but like Refulue mm -hmm. is probably going to leave WhatsApp, are they still going to get your data via Facebook then anyway? So a lot of people have been asking, if I don't have Facebook, if I leave Facebook and keep my WhatsApp, what happens? They're still going to get your data. Either way, that data still goes through. So, you know, it's kind of a no-win situation here. And are the other two, Telegram and Signal, are they perfect? They don't sell your data? I mean, or are we like trading one version of this for another? Listen, no app is perfect. At the end of the day, if you're online in any form, your data is going to be out there. Mm, but sure. when it comes to Signal and Telegram... Fantastic. Brendan, thanks so much for your time this Signal evening. Signal is actually the We're gonna most go on secure. A Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. Thanks for your time this evening, Brendan. We are going to go on a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking to the um, exceptional uh, pulmonologist, Dr. Emmanuel Taban, who will be in studio telling us more about the work that he's been doing. And uh, Ms. Mr. Hotlabi, it's That's been a pleasure so as always. It's so short. It's always <laughs> short. Don't forget to vote for new host. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wrong show. Wrong show. <laughs> Wrong show. I thought you wanted to vote for more time. Thanks for the time. Next time, no? All right. Awesome. See after the break. <laughs> Welcome back. You are still watching Trending SA right here on SABC3. Now, South Africa is facing our second wave of this COVID-19 pandemic, and the number of positive cases continues to rise daily. Um, a, a few or a number of medical interventions have been established to help patients with severe symptoms of COVID-19. And our guest tonight is a leading pulmonologist who saved the lives of critically ill COVID-19 patients who are on uh, ventilators, and he's using therapeutic bronchoscopy. Okay, Dr. Emmanuel Taban, thank you so much for joining us on Trending SA. It's great to have you here. 
Thank you so much. It's actually interesting that you could actually pronounce the word correctly finally. <laughs> <laughs> so. Bronchoscopy? Exactly. Bronchoscopy. We have been yes. practicing all uh, Jan. January. Um, so, Doc, the World Health Organization is not recommending this course of treatment, which is the most interesting thing I've probably heard this last month since I became aware of your story. Why is it that they don't believe the therapeutic bronchoscopy should be recommended? No, I think, I think the issue that they, I think at the beginning of the, the, when they issued the first guidelines, they are mm. not aware because at that time the literature was just saying that patients with COVID-19, that they don't develop mucus plaques. Mm. That was how the recommendation were based mm. on. Okay. And that's when we start treating COVID-19, we also having that assumption that those patients don't get mucus plaque. Until, of course, when our patients start dying, that's when we start questioning about the literature. Why are they saying those people cannot develop mucus plaque? And why are the blue whites, why, why do they die actually? Mm. And the sad reality is that, I mean, you saw a lot of videos come from Italy that if you got COVID-19, you're going to reach the point that you can't breathe. Mm. Doctors cannot put air into your lung and then you die. Mm. Which for me, after of course, when I performed the post bronchoscopy, is actually absolutely rubbish. Because those people cannot breathe, not because they have lung fibrosis, they're actually having mucus plaque that block the airways. Mm. And that's really, I think, is something that is no longer for debate. It's a fact. Okay. So, Doug, I, mean, I want to know, um, when did you discover Ugut, this, this procedure is the one that's actually going to work? And, and, and at, at what stage do you decide, Ugut, okay, this is the procedure that we are going to go for now? I think, I think like any, you know, you know, like anybody else, if there's any, if you have to prepare yourself when the COVID was coming, because initially it was China, then you wonder, okay, great, it's not coming here. Mm. Then it was in, in Europe. Then you say, okay, you know what, let's see what we could do. Then of course, the first thing you read literature, mm. and then you start coming what is working in Italy and Germany and all those. But when I arrived here, of course, it was a big surprise. It came, the first case did very well. Then my second case, of course, he did very well for five, seven days. And then we started going backward until I couldn't, the oxygen level, what we call saturation, was sitting at about 93, then goes to 85, 60, 20, sure. and the patient died. So, Dr. Taban, let's just explain the terminology, mucus plugs. First of all, what they are, and you know, are there any, any other therapies or interventions that can be utilized that remove these mucus uh, plugs and allow patients to breathe better? Yeah, I think uh, the issue that you can use preventive measures. Mm. Preventive measures means what happens that when, when you suspect that the patient got mucus plaque, you can give them what you call mycolytics. Sure. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, I think everybody is well know, know one of them called ACC 200. Oh. That actually can be used on those patients. And then, of course, if you're in ICU, we're having two different ones. One's called uh, uh, bisolvent that can be given as nebulization. And then the second is DNAs, that one, of course, which was previously used in cystic fibrosis. So those three treatments actually can help prevent mucus plaque. So th yes, there's treatment that you could use before you become critical. What if they're already there, dogs? Oh, then what do you do? What can, you, can I do at home if well, they're already there? I think, I think at home, uh, I remember there was a video that surfaced that actually teach you how to actually get mucus out of your lung. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that you can use the ACC 200. Mm -hmm. And of course, physiotherapy also mm -hmm. helps to remove the mucus. So, so there's a role so that you could actually, you can use different interventions extra to get there. But so your study was published mm -hmm. and then the Ministry of Health still issued a recommendation and said they, they, they can't recommend that this be the course of treatment. Is that a capacity issue? Is it because we don't have a million pulmonologists on standby ready to do this for people? Or is it a medical science question? I don't think it's based on medical science because this, I mean, mucus plaque is factual because mm -hmm. after I released my study, there was a study that came also from Spain where they did quite a larger number, about 101 cases. Yeah. And also confirmed this mucus plaque and actually even this ongoing study in Harvard's Boston University that they're, also, they're doing trial on one of the mycolytic on COVID-19 patients. Okay. So it's not really about that. I think it's, it's, I think it's born out of fear. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the fact that, of course, we're having about 99 pulmonologists in the country. 99? 99, oh. yes. And, and in which, of course, few of us are very younger. And most, like all other doctors, there's fear of acquiring COVID-19. And the biggest issue is that people are afraid to contract the virus. But in my case, I mean, how can you be afraid of contracting a virus 
when you're supposed to be the leading figure in treating the virus. I mean, I'm the pulmonologist. If I'm going to be running away, what about TB presenter? What about the, the, the others who actually got no knowledge? So, so we, we, I mean, we have to be the frontliners. We have to kind of save our people life, patient lives. And I think for me, South African government, I mean, they acknowledge it, but they, what they could have done was actually to educate the publics about actually what to do when they have COVID-19, you know? And that's for me, that would be more important. So, Doc, what is the success rate of your treatment, your, your patients, as far as we, as this treatment is involved? Okay. So, success rate, I think we had done about 40 to 50 cases, mm -hmm. in which I think during the, the course of procedure, nobody has died. However, those with the severe disease, we, I think we lost about three to four patients that are related to complications from other things not related to the lung. Mm. And I think on my opinion that patients with COVID-19, if you we were having to have a proper infrastructure, we should not be losing so many number of patients the way we are losing now. Mm. Okay. And which is, I think for me, is factual. So I've done the maths. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor is saying 90%. So, yes. you know, before we let you go, Doc, and, you know, thanks for those very, very clear answers. What I'm curious about is how do you get a body, global body like a WHO or even a national body like the Department of Health to start to relook their stance, right? And yes, you pointed to infrastructure and uh, other issues surrounding that. But how do you begin to uh, get them to relook their stance on uh, bronchoscopies? I, I, think, I, think, I don't think it's really all about the Department of Health. It's all about the, the, the doctors. As a, as a pulmonologist, we're an expert in our own field. We're the leaders in pulmonology, mm -hmm. not Department of Health, not, not World Health Organization. So basically what, it, what has happened now in South Africa, we have a lot of pulmonologists who are now performing the procedures without any problems. Mm -hmm. And currently actually, even the government hospitals, they actually try to perform them. And I remember one of the government hospitals, which I don't want to mention exactly, they was quite, they don't want to do bronchoscopy because they're afraid that the, the equipment will be infected. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's the sad reality. Mm -hmm. Doc? Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and for being my new doctor, should this disease come my way. Um, the doc has agreed. Um, yes, and that's how Training SA helps you escape the norm. Join us again tomorrow right here on SABC3, where we'll be talking to Professor Shabir Madi, who will be helping us unpack the government's proposed vaccine rollout. Good night, South Africa, Santander, Sonbunaksas. Thank you.